Thank you very much for that gracious introduction. And I, my apologies to everybody who has signed up for this lecture series. I'm realizing I'm doing what should have been the first lecture last. So I thank you for um, your patience. Also, I understand that a handout has been distributed to everybody. I'm not gonna be talking about every single item on the handout, but I wanted you to be able to have some kind of um, chronological skeletal structure um, if you care to follow uh, by using the handout um, in order to, um, um, oh dear, something just strange happened to my screen. I have the list of participants on the screen. Tadeus, can you get me back to the mosaic? That's better. Okay, before, uh, before I start, what I'd like to do is look at the mosaic that uh, served as the icon uh, for this lecture. This figure on the right is, um, is a sixth century mosaic and it's got a very interesting coding. If you'll notice the figure is standing with one foot on a lion and another foot on a serpent. He's holding a book with Latin writing on it and he has a staff over his so shoulder. The lion and the, and the serpent are a reference to Psalm 9113 from the Jewish scriptures. The Latin is from the Gospel of John. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, which means that this figure is announcing himself as Christ. He is dressed like a Roman general, which means he's dressed like a Roman emperor. And you'll notice with the staff over his shoulder how very delicate the reference is to the way Jesus of Nazareth died. It's a very subtle um, cross that he's holding over his staff. What I want to do in our time together is tell you the story about how, especially in light of how Jesus of Nazareth was uh, executed, how this type of image becomes possible by the, uh, by the end of the late Roman empire. So with that as introduction, uh, if you could remove the mosaic please now. I'll start, um, I'll start the lecture. Thank you. Okay. I would like to share with you a story today about gods and humans in the Roman empire. We'll cover approximately 500 years from the period of Augustus in the minus first century to the Christian emperors of the mid fifth century. I'll be speaking about pagans who were the majority population throughout this period, as well as about Jews and eventually about Christians as well. But in order to do so, I have to first define three terms, gods, humans, and empire. Ancient people thought differently about these three terms from the way that we do as 21st century people. And what I'd like to have us all do together today is learn to think and imagine how they thought about these ideas. Consequently, I'm going to break my lecture down into four parts. The first part is on gods. The second part is on gods and humans. The third part is on power politics, by which I mean empire. And the final fourth section will be on power politics in the third through fifth centuries toward the end of the Roman Empire in the West. So with that is introduction, let's start with the idea of God or divinity, which is the same word in Greek. God in ancient cultures was first of all, a register of power. Gods are powerful and any God, even somebody else's God is more powerful than any human. Ancient gods were superhuman intelligences, and unfortunately, they were emotionally very labile. The best way to keep on the good side of a god was to follow the rules for showing affection and respect that that god had revealed to his or her people. That's a very important idea because it's an idea that will remain constant throughout the period of five centuries that I'm talking about. So I'll say it again. 
the best way to keep on the good side of a God was to follow those rules for showing affection and respect that the God him or herself had revealed. You're going to be coming up to that thought again at the end of the lecture. Revealed religious protocols shaped space, time, politics, and ancient social life. Temples, altars, calendars, celebrations, possessions, gatherings, community governance, foodways, orders of sacrifices, all kept according to the gods' wishes and instructions, endeared humans to their gods. This was important because God supervised the well being of individuals, of families, of cities, and of empires. Keep heaven happy and things on earth would stay calm. Alienating heaven could make things go desperately wrong. Earthquake or fire, famine or flood, invasion, disruption, disease. The ancient world did not know anything like a theologically neutral ca catastrophe. When things on earth erupted, responsible people searched for the root reason in heaven. Showing God's love, respect, and obedience, in other words, what we call piety, went far towards keeping things calm on earth. The intrinsically unbalanced power relations between humans and their gods, in other words, was kept in a sort of dynamic equilibrium through prayer, by adhering to mandated behaviors, and by enacting correct ritual. How exactly was heaven organized? Please remember that in the Roman period and up until Copernicus in the 16th century, the earth stood at the center of the universe. Above the earth came first the sphere of the moon and after the moon, the spheres of the sun and of the five planets known to antiquity. Above and outermost stood the realm of the fixed stars, glowing, immortal, and beautiful. All of these cosmic entities were conceived of as divine embodied intelligences. In other words, stars and planets were gods. We still call them by their divine names, Jupiter, Venus, Mercury. Stars and planets were gods, and that is exactly how the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria named them in his Greek language commentary on Genesis. According to Philo, his own God, the Jewish God, had made these other gods. But my point is, like his pagan contemporaries, Philo referred to stars and planets as gods. God, in other words, was a very elastic term. It stretched between earth and the highest heaven, from the highest God to various special humans who were or who became gods. For ancient monotheists, whether they were Jewish or pagan, a single highest God reigned supreme. But the highest God, by definition, is a supreme member of a class of beings called gods. The highest God, whether he were Jewish or pagan, presided over ranks of lower gods, astral and cosmic gods, in between gods, uh, godlings, we might call them, unfortunately translated usually as demons in English, but the, the, the Greek word means godlings. There were divine messengers. Our word for them is angels. There were various spirits, and there were special humans, like the Roman emperor. All of these beings were designated and referred to as gods. The cosmic spheres were the hardware. Sacrifices, prayers, dreams, incantations, various kinds of divination, all of these practices were the software. But the original World Wide Web comprised the many superhuman and non-human inhabitants of this divine cosmos, which supervised the communications humming across these different frequencies between heaven and earth. So this was the gods, and this was the gods' neighborhood. How did gods relate to humans? Gods like humans had emotional lives. 
They cared about and formed bonds with specific peoples and places. Athena was the particular divinity of Athens, the goddess of the Athenians. Jupiter Maximus was particularly the god of Rome. The Jewish god attached to Jerusalem and to the people Israel. Sacrifices for all of these divinities was thought to attract the divine presence to the God's altar. Such demonstrations of piety, the enactments of inherited divine protocols reinforced positive relations between a people and their gods. The connection between gods and peoples was imagined and expressed as a family connection. Particular gods and their particular peoples formed family groups. This family language is used everywhere in ancient literature. For pagan culture, family connections could be quite literal. They were constructed and construed as genealogical and as biological. In the distant past, a god had had sexual relations with the human partner, and from their union, whole people groups, or at least their leaders, were thought to descend. The Romans, through Aeneas, were directly related to Venus, and the family of Julius Caesar was particularly so related. Spartans, sensibly, descended from Heracles. Zeus and Heracles socialized with human females quite a bit, and as a result, they left behind many human offspring who sorted themselves out into discrete people groups. These people groups were specific to particular places, traditions, languages, and kinship networks. We see this spelled out, for example, in Genesis 10, the table of nations, which gives us one sample of this way of thinking. When Noah's sons and their descendants are divided into 70 goyim, people groups, or ethne in Greek, and they're divided according to their languages, in their lands, by their tribes, and in their nations. This configuration of terms defines what ancients called kinship and what moderns call ethnicity, people groupness. Kinship, then, was another category, like God, that spanned heaven and earth. In this way, and for this reason, what we think of as religion and what we think of as ethnicity, people groupness, in antiquity entirely overlapped. If you were Tyrian, your native land was Phoenicia, your language was Punic, and your particular god was Melkart. If you were Roman, your city was Rome, your language was Latin, and your piety was particularly directed toward Jupiter Capitolinus. In our own historical period, this tight correlation between ethnicity and religion has remained the case for Jews, though then as now, the definition of a Jew was subject to heated internal debate. In antiquity, however, Jews in this regard were just like everybody else, a particular ethnic group with its particular religion. Please note, Jews, like other ancient peoples, also used family language to describe their relationship to their God. God was Israel's father. Israel was God's firstborn son. The kings of David's line were especially considered sons, but, but the relationship was not biological or genealogical. The relationship between God and Israel was affective about feelings, and it was covenantal. God chose Israel because he loved them, and he and the people bound themselves together by mutual covenants, that is, by mutual agreements, which is one of the reasons why uh, marriage metaphors also describe their relationship. No biological basis grounded this family language because the Jewish God did not have sexual relations with humans. According to Genesis 6, the sons of this God did have such sexual relations, but that's a completely different story. In the period of the Maccabees, in the second century before the Common Era, 
God's sexual abstinence created something of a diplomatic problem for Jerusalem. Ancient Mediterranean politics ran according to something scholars called kinship diplomacy. Treaties and trade agreements between cities were drawn up and established by establishing family genealogies that traced backwards to divine ancestors. This shared divine descent stabilized such agreements because it made the current parties to negotiations into family. They were now kinsmen. Since the Jewish God left no human progeny, Maccabean diplomats arranged instead for Her Heracles, I'm not making this up, to acquire a Jewish girlfriend, a granddaughter of Abraham's. This story is related in first and in second Maccabees and in Josephus antiquities. It was in this way that Jerusalem was able to establish diplomatic ties with that descendant of Hercules, the Spartans. The point I will ask you to bear in mind is that for antiquity, all religions were ethnic and all ethnicities were religious. People were born into their relationship with their gods. This brings us to gods, humans, and power politics part one in the first and in the second century. The socio-political framework for all of these different ethno-religious groups was the Roman Empire. One definition of empire, if we think in terms of humans, is, quote, the greatest number of peoples under the central government. But to phrase the same idea theologically, which we could do, empire is the greatest number of gods under the umbrella of a single central government. The Roman Republic was already a well-muscled international power player during the period of the Maccabees. Under Augustus from 31 BCE, the Republic switched to being ruled by a single man. Romans prided themselves on their piety to which they attributed their unparalleled military and political success. Assembling under their control a huge and various mass of different peoples, Rome respected religious difference. It literally just came with the territory. Each people had its own gods. The only pragmatic policy, therefore, was a kind of religious pluralism. And indeed, religious pluralism is what in general prevailed. The two markers of respectable religion were its antiquity and its ethnicity. Against this particular kind of wallpaper, Jews did not stand out. The Jewish God was known to be idiosyncratic, however, compared to his Mediterranean colleagues. The Jewish God demanded that he alone be the object of his own people's worship. In Jewish territories, this caused no problem. In the Greek and Latin speaking Western diaspora, however, tensions could arise. Jews had been settled in the Greek speaking West since before the time of Alexander the Great, who died in minus 323. Western living Jews assumed Greek as their vernacular. By the late third and early second century BCE, God himself began to speak Greek. The Torah was translated into Greek, which was the English of antiquity, an international language. Eventually, other Jewish sacred writings were translated as well. This helped what we might call interfaith relations. Pagan city dwellers could drop into Jewish community centers one day out of every seven to hear Bible stories read or recited in their own Greek vernacular. We know about this because some pagan writers complain about it. Eventually, some Christian writers will complain about it, and we have some synagogue inscriptions attesting to it. Pagans in this way became acquainted with the Jewish God 
and even went on pilgrimage to visit his temple in Jerusalem. Diaspora Jews we know from inscriptions, amulets, papyri, and various literary sources found their feet in the Greco-Roman city. But please remember, these cities were not neutral secular urban spaces. Ancient cities were pagan religious institutions. The celebration of the city's gods would fall under the equivalent of the Department of Homeland Security. By living in a diaspora city, Jews necessarily lived with pagan neighbors, both human and divine. Jews joined foreign armies. They consulted pagan magicians. They served as citizens and as town councilors and as athletes in games dedicated to Greek gods like the Olympics. But Jews evidently avoided active participation in public civic cult. Greek and Roman ethnographers and culture critics complain about this, but Roman government gave Jews a pass. Jewish customs were ancient and they were ancestral. They therefore met the Roman criteria of respectable religion. Those of you familiar with Jewish history will know already of the three major political and military collisions between Jews and Rome that occurred in the late first and early second century CE. In the turmoil at the end of the emperor Nero's reign, various Judean factions fought to free the region from Herod's descendants and from Roman rule. Things ended badly. First with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70, and then again in 115 to 117, we have murky evidence of another revolt in the diaspora near Egypt and along the coast of Eastern North Africa. And Rome took care of that rebellion too. Finally, probably in response to the Emperor Hadrian's initiative to build a pagan city on top of the ruins of Jerusalem, Bar Kokhba led a revolt in 132 to 135. This too ended in utter defeat. Diaspora Jewish populations were not pulled into this last revolt, but Judea, Jewishly, became a wasteland. It was at this point that the Romans, looking to the Philistines, renamed the region Palestina. Gods and their people groups were intimately associated. When a people was conquered by another people, the gods of the victors were thought to have defeated the gods of the losers. That is certainly how Rome saw things. After 70, they enforced attacks on all Jews, analogous to the old temple contribution, which they siphoned off to the temple of their own high god in Rome, namely to Jupiter. Interestingly, we hear the same view that the gods of Rome had defeated the god of the Jews echoed in writings by Gentile Christian figures in the second century, but they disavow it. These Christians belong to groups who claimed the Jewish scriptures for their own churches. In the second century, there was no New Testament yet. So the Jewish scriptures in Greek were not yet the Old Testament. Jewish scriptures in Greek were simply claimed by some Christian Gentiles as speaking to and for Gentile churches, as these Christians repeated the Roman claim that Rome's gods had defeated the God of Israel, they repudiated this view as well. Jews, of course, had long experience with military defeat. A half a millennium earlier, when Nebuchadnezzar had leveled the city in minus 586, Solomon's temple had been destroyed. The Jewish answer to the recent Roman setback was thus well prepared. The gods of Rome had not defeated the God of the Jews, said the Jews. Israel's God had in fact used the Romans just as earlier he had used the Babylonians. Why? Because Israel's God was punishing Israel for its sins. But for what sins? The answer you got depended on whom you asked. The rabbis eventually will answer that it was a punishment for causeless hatred. 
Gentile Christians who were religiously invested in Jewish scriptures answered because the Jews had rejected Jesus. But both groups made the same larger point. The God of Israel was still the highest and the mightiest God. For Jews, that God remained Jewish. For Gentile Christians, however, that God became ethnically, ethnically neutral. He was the highest God, but he was no longer the main character described in the narrative of Jewish scripture. The role of the God who appeared in Jewish history, said these Christians, was actually played by that God's eternal son, the Christian Messiah, before he had manifested as Jesus of Nazareth. Read correctly, according to these Gentile Christian groups, the Greek Bible was actually a book about the preexistent Christ. Christ's father, the highest God, receded into the atmosphere of pagan philosophy's highest God. The highest God in second century Gentile Christianity, in other words, lost his Jewish identity. So eventually would the Christian Messiah, and so too would that Messiah's special apostle. By the mid-second century, in some Gentile Christian circles, the God of Israel was not only not Jewish, he was anti-Jewish, as was his son, the Messiah, and also his apostle, Paul. So we come finally to my fourth and final section, God's, humans, and power politics in the third century and after. Why were early Christians persecuted by the pagan empire if Rome's policy was a generalized, pragmatic, practical pluralism? The answer is because Christianity in any of its forms was neither ancient nor was it ancestral. Gentile Christians might claim to be the true Israel, but in the eyes of their neighbors and of the provincial governors, Gentile Christians were simply deviant pagans who refused to shoulder their inherited obligations to their own gods. This refusal put the well-being of the city and even of the empire at risk. Ex-pagan pagans made pagan gods angry, or that's what the Romans thought. The effects could be catastrophic, and in the mid-third century, they were. In the period between the mid-first to the mid-third centuries, Gentile Christians might be required by local authorities to offer for the well-being of the city or of the empire. How and why these Christians found themselves before tribunals is a question that continues to baffle historians because no law forbade the practice of Christianity. And further, before 250, there was no mechanism in place to monitor the religious activities of anybody. But we find complaints in Christian texts that whenever some natural disaster occurred, a flood or a famine or an earthquake or some unusual astronomical occurrence, Gentile Christians were blamed. No rain because of the Christians was a proverbial expression. Fearful pagan populations scapegoated these ex-pagan Gentiles. Their disrespect for their own gods was putting everybody at risk. How many Christians were persecuted like this? We have no idea, although one church father in the year 248 claimed that the number could easily be counted. Jews throughout this period were allowed to continue in their own ancestral practices precisely because they were ancestral. Ex-pagan Gentiles did not receive such a pass. The empire itself, meanwhile, reconfigured itself in two important ways. In the year 212, Roman citizenship was extended to all free inhabitants of the empire. One reason for this is that likely it increased the tax base. And in the year 250, in the middle of catastrophic decades during which 24 emperors came and went and every frontier collapsed, the emperor Decius ordered that all Roman citizens, 
which is a much larger population after 212, all Roman citizens had to sacrifice to the gods for the well being of the empire, which clearly needed all the help it could get. This was not an anti Christian initiative. Christians could go on doing whatever it was they did when they got together. It was instead a both and initiative. Do your own thing, but also supplicate heaven for the well being of the state. Jewish Romans got a pass, Christian Romans did not. We know from Christian writings that many Christians, including clergy, went into hiding or they forged certificates saying that they had complied with the order or they indeed made a supplication to the Roman gods. The result of this behavior was a crisis of, di of discipline within the communities. How could such fallen sinners be permitted to commune with the church? Should they be given some kind of penance? Should they be rebaptized? Should bishops who had sacrificed resign from their leadership positions? And anyway, who had the authority to forgive anybody? Bishops who had avoided sacrifice by fleeing or laymen who had risked prison and even death by staying put? This internal crisis continued, stoked by two more initiatives, this time specifically aimed at Christians, that occurred between the 250s and the 300s. Again, Christianity was a public religion. There were Christian buildings. Christians were allowed to practice, but there was pressure put on Christian leaders to take responsibility for the well being of the empire. And then, of course, with Constantine, things changed again. Historians will never tire of trying to understand why Constantine decided to become the patron of one particular Christian sect. His military support was secure. His own army had irregularly already proclaimed him as emperor. His political situation, however, was precarious. He was leading a rebellion against established Roman leadership, and he needed political support. Christians were a sizable minority in many of the empire's cities, and especially in the city of Rome. By becoming their patron, Constantine established his own urban base. Once he defeated his Western rival in the year 312 and his Eastern rival in the year 324, he reunited the Roman Empire. He also became intensely involved in internal Christian affairs. As a result, one of Constantine's first acts as supreme emperor was to persecute Christians. That is, those Christians belonging to sects other than the group that he himself had backed. Such Christian Romans were designated heretics. They had their property seized, they were forbidden to meet, their books were burned, their buildings were taken over. So that's how we know that Christians even before Constantine had public buildings. Only one church could be the true church. We have no idea how effective such legislation was, but where an Orthodox bishop had the ear of the government, he could make sure to send his Christian rivals into exile. The second group to feel the shifts in the cultural winds were pagan Romans, whose public sacrifices were banned, whose public funding was cut, and eventually whose temples were seized and either destroyed or repurposed as churches. We have reports in Christian literature about some dramatic acts of destruction in major cities, but again, we have no idea how genu generally effective such anti-pagan legislation was. What we do know is that many Roman senators continued in their traditional ways well into the fifth century. What about Jewish Romans? The Christian denomination sponsored by the Roman government was one that now claimed Jewish scriptures as the Christian Old Testament as we already saw in our mosaic. And their own gospels portrayed a Jesus who went to synagogue on the Sabbath, who wore tzitzit, the Jewish prayer fringes, 
who commented on the correct size of tefillin and who worshiped in the temple during the Jewish holidays. We might say that as a legitimate religion, Judaism was grandfathered in and Jews continued to be protected by Roman law. Jews had the right to assemble and troops were not to be garrisoned in synagogue buildings, nor were Jewish buildings to be seized by Christian populations. An awkward moment occurred 50 years later when Constantine's nephew, Julian, converted from Orthodox Christianity to classical paganism. Julian knew how to make mischief. One of his first acts as emperor was to permit all the exiled Christian bishops to return home. And he forced the Orthodox bishops to relinquish their rivals' Christian properties that they had formerly seized. Julian also well knew how Christians had continuously pointed to the Jerusalem temple's destruction as proof that God had disavowed Jewish sacrifice and that Judaism itself was defunct to be superseded by the Christian church. So Julian had a brilliant idea. He decided to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. A Jewish temple built by an actively pagan Gentile empire would have been pretty awkward for the rabbis. But the main point for Julian is that it would have been a major loss of face, or at least that's what he hoped, for the formerly official church in which he had been raised. But after two years in office, Julian died on campaign against the Persians. His idea went nowhere, and the Orthodox bishops roared back into power with Julian's Christian successor. We have evidence, both archeological and literary, of the Christian seizure of synagogues in this later period. Like their heretical and pagan contemporaries, Jewish Romans, because of their religious practices, were also increasingly seen as un-Roman. To be Roman, by the late fifth century was to be an Orthodox Christian, a member of the emperor's own church, or this is what the bishops insisted. Heretics, pagans, and Jews just, came, just accordingly came to be seen as populations of resident aliens. Things did not have to be this way. Our question is, why did things work out this way? What happened to the old indigenous criteria of religious legitimacy, namely antiquity and ethnicity? What fractured the old family identification between gods and their humans? Why did ascendant Christian power lead to the end of pragmatic religious pluralism? I have two answers, I think, and they are linked. First, the politics of both heaven and earth became increasingly polarized. In the cosmos, the old worldwide web of higher gods, astral gods, lower gods, messenger gods, spirits, and divine humans hardened into a stable two-party system of angels and demons. The older communicative software was replaced by a newer program, the power of martyred saints. Most of the versions about saints martyrdoms that we now have were embellished or even composed in the period after the accession, ascension of Constantine. Through the cult of the saints, pilgrimage routes evolved, tourism picked up, and believers would go for cures by touching the martyrs relics now enshrined in imperial Christian architecture. And earthly politics were no less polarized. If you were not a member of the emperor's church, you were not only not Christian, you were not really Roman either. Legal disabilities soon followed. Gentile Orthodox Christians, however, did hold on to one ancient idea the conviction that gods and humans formed family groups. But in this conviction, they followed an iteration of the Jewish model. 
God was their father, and Christians, through Christ, had become adopted as his children. There was no genealogical connection. Like the Jews, Christian family relations with their God was covenantal and affective, but it was formed through a new covenant made through God's divine son, the Christ, who himself was an offspring of the divine spirit and a human woman, Mary. So strong was this idea of family that the, in the sixth century mosaic that we've seen, Christ can be portrayed as a Roman emperor sheathed in the armor of a Roman military officer. If Orthodox Romans were God's true family, then God's divine font, son, was part of the Roman family. One other ancient idea remained absolutely identifiably intact throughout this period. It was an idea whose consistency, I think, accelerated all of these other changes. That idea was that empire could thrive only if heaven were happy. Now that the religious denomination of heaven had shifted, heretics, pagans, and Jews made God unhappy, or so thought the Orthodox. Only proper ritual protocols could ensure the goodwill of heaven. This progressive hardening of religious categories, which had sponsored the unprecedented harassment of Gentile Christians in the earlier period, now expressed the convictions of the current theopolitical elite. If the Persians invaded, if the land withheld its fruits, if disease stalked the cities, the root reason had to be divine anger. Alienating heaven put the empire at risk. Policing the religion of those on earth just lent a feeling of measure and control. The muscular combination of politics, power, and theology all worked to protect the empire. Ideologues are people, but not all people are ideologues. We know from sermons and from the laws of church councils complaining about it, that many people, to the bishop's annoyance, kept on mixing with and marrying each other. Christian clergy specifically are criticized for helping Jews keep lamps lit in synagogues. Christians also complain about other Christians who went to synagogues for Rosh Hashanah or who attended meals in their neighbor's sukkahs. Pagans, Jews, and all sorts of Christians still continued to serve on town councils, and together they enjoyed urban spectacles like horse races and theatrical performances, which bishops complained about too, and so do rabbis. Long after the fall of the Western Empire, in the mid fifth century, Mediterranean social life continued to limp along. But the rhetoric of separation and the disparagement of difference continued to be voiced by ecclesiastical elites. And as we know from our own day, toxic rhetoric can eventually affect social reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Fredrickson, for wrapping up our series in such a fun fashion. So some questions from the audience. Um, People were curious about the spread of Christianity, especially before Constantine, and wanted to know what you think are some socio-political economic reasons that might have contributed to that spread. Well, that's a nice small question. Uh, sure. Um, we don't know. We don't know. One uh, reason um, people think in the very first generation where we have evidence of Paul's letters, which are the earliest stratum of uh, evidence in the New Testament, he writes in the middle of the first century, is that the movement empowered people to uh, be able to uh, get rid of demons, to have prophecies and visions, um, to work cures, to discern between spirits. Paul lists all these benefits um, that people can have if they're members of his community. And so this type of uh, charismatic empowerment obviously played a role. 
Um, we don't know anything about the social classes. They seem to be mixed uh, in these communities. We don't know. Um, we don't know. Actually, this is uh, interesting. If you do uh, feminist history, it used to be thought that Christianity spread um, particularly among women, but it turns out that saying that something spreads among women is a Roman form of insulting something. It's a way of saying women do this. So um, when we have reports of uh, in pagan sources that Christianity is spreading among women, it's a put down. And when we have reports in uh, Christian sources that say, look, even women are behaving now, it's another way. We don't, all this is, is a type of, of rhetoric. We don't actually know demographically what it means. We don't know, have any firm demographic numbers for the total population of the Roman Empire. We don't know how many Jews lived in the Roman Empire. And we don't know about the rates of, and remember, there are all different types of Christianities. One of the most Jewish things about all these types of Gentile Christianities is they're fighting furiously with each other about the best way to be Christian. So um, in terms of answering this question, having said all this, I'm afraid I can't answer the question. Let's stick with Constantine. You have quite a few questions. I'll, I'll try to lump them together to some extent. Uh, some people were curious about Constantine in the earliest history of anti-Semitism, and whether or not, or in what ways it could be traced all the way back to Constantine. And uh, others asked about Constantine's orthodoxy. Uh, what, what was his orthodoxy to the extent that we know? Why did he pick that particular type of Christianity? And um, what does, why did he send some unorthodox Christians into exile? What does unorthodox mean in that context? And what does going into exile mean in that context? Should I start with the anti-Semitism question first? If that's start, okay. with what it, start with whatever you'd like. Okay. Um, people who wrote ethnographies in antiquity uh, tended to indulge in ethnic stereotyping when they described any group. So you can find uh, the ancient equivalent of anthropologists or culture critics or ethnographers saying all Egyptians are like this or all um, Gauls are like that, or the Germans are like this, or everybody knows the Persians are like that. One, a, a colleague of mine, Gidi Bohach, has said that when it came to ethnic stereotyping, even the stereotypes were stereotyped. All these Greeks and then Romans would say that Persians were effeminate, or um, if they didn't like a particular group, one way of saying not in my backyard was to accuse the group of cannibalism or of incest to antisocial behaviors you didn't want happening in your neighborhood. There is a kind of traditional trash talk. A lot of the trash talk against Jews remains in the evidence. We have the, the evidence of other ancient kinds of trash talk too, but a lot of the anti-Jewish talk remains because it was repurposed later by the Gentile Christian church. But this, this idea of calling out different ethnic groups for being weird because they're not like your own group is something that precedes Constantine by, by centuries. Now, let's see, you asked five different questions about Constantine. The first one was, how orthodox was he? Is that right? Um, orthodox. What does it mean to call him orthodox? I mean, what defines his Christianity as opposed to other types of Christianities in the empire? Um, orthodoxy is an idea under construction. Um, the accusations of um, heterodoxy and, or first of all, orthodoxy is always my doxy. And if you have a different opinion from me, then you are heterodox, you have a, a different opinion. So before Constantine, Christian groups were accusing each other of heresy and, and claiming orthodoxy for themselves, no matter what particular sect they represented. The difference is that once Constantine patronizes one particular group, um, it begins to have social consequences. 
so that um, bishops who are members of the group that Constantine acknowledges are able to point to the bishop across the street who's running a different denomination of Christianity and saying, I'm, I'm going to call the army and you're going to have to get out of town and we're taking over your basilica. So there's a kind of um, uh, empowerment that goes on for this particular group. I should also say that poor Constantine backed this one group probably because it was particularly representative of the Christian uh, denominations in Rome. But then when he himself becomes head of the church, he makes himself, he's a supervisor of all the bishops, immediately Orthodox Christianity begins splintering over questions of theology and over questions of local politics. So even, even the group that Constantine backs, which calls itself Catholic, meaning universal, and Orthodox, which means right thinking, even those bishops are arguing with each other. So the I, Orthodoxy is an idea and a rhetoric more than it's an actual empirical description of something, if that helps. Thank you. A question for Ashley from a former student of mine, so I need to sneak this one in. <laughs> Do you think that the earliest Christians viewed themselves as maintaining good relations with heaven for the sake of earth, or did they view their own role in the cosmos differently, perhaps even view the cosmos differently, I'll add? What a great question. How lucky you are to have such a good student. Um, Earliest Christians, uh, well, the very earliest Christians, if we can use this term for them, are of a Messianic Jewish group, which is expecting the coming of the kingdom of God in its own generation. So they're not taking a long view. What they're doing is saying that they're preparing rightly for the coming kingdom of God. And Paul, what Paul is telling his ex-pagan uh, communities to do is to stop acting like pagans to, and to act more like idealized versions of Jews. They are to um, um, dedicate time to prayer. They're to be uh, have uh, sexually chaste marriages, or if they're able to, um, they're to uh, concentrate on prayer for the coming of the kingdom. They're supposed to collect money to be sent back to Jerusalem uh, to support the community there. They're, um, uh, they're not expecting the world to continue uh, as it is because they're expecting the, resur the imminent resurrection of the dead and the redemption of the righteous. So their, their view of the very first generation is that they were the only generation of the movement. Um, it turns out that timekeeping was off. And this, this idea of, uh, I'm sorry, I have to decline something. Um, I'm sorry, the, um, this idea that the world is imminently going to end, that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead and a final judgment and uh, the, the redemption of the righteous, and it's going to happen soon, is one of the longest lived ideas that enters from Judaism into Christianity. And there are probably more Christians on, on the planet today who think this way than there were in the first and second century. So that idea of millenarianism means that the, the world is, which means the relationship between heaven and earth is about to be radically reconfigured. Here, even though you pleaded ignorance about numbers, there are a lot of questions about numbers, especially as they relate to ethnicity. So can you talk a little bit more about the ancient concept of ethnicity? I'm gonna throw into the question, you know, how did conversion, which I gather started to emerge at this period, at least within Judaism, uh, complicate notions of ethnicity? People wanted to then know how totally ethnic Judaism really was in this period. And in terms of demographics, if not numbers, you know, People have estimated that 10% or more of the Roman Empire was Jewish at its height. I mean, what do you think of such estimates? Maybe they're right. We have no way of knowing. 
maybe they're wrong. We, we, we have no way of knowing. We don't know for a given point how many people lived in Salem Village. And uh, it's a lot closer to our own time period. And we have a lot more basic grave finds and square footage to figure stuff out. I mean, ancient demographics is really um, a form of wistful thinking, I think. Um, that crackling sound that some of you heard is not a bomb. It's the ice melting off the roof of my house in New Hampshire and collapsing. Um, not the house, the ice. Um, Ethnicity and conversion. There was a spectrum of views about whether it was possible to convert or not. Some Jews didn't think it was possible. Um, you could you could assume Jewish. Um, if you are a lot of this is about males. You could assume Jewish behaviors, but you couldn't actually change ethnicity. Uh, ultimately, with rabbinic Judaism, there you can convert. Uh, which means cha and notionally changing your ancestors and changing your ethnicity, which is, again, a very complicated idea. For women, usually in antiquity, the woman's social identity follows that of her husband. So Shia Cohen has written a lot about this, that um, that's probably uh, in, the, in the Roman period, one way that um, women become Jews is by marrying uh, a Jewish male. Um, also, Josephus talks about women in uh, Adiabene, uh, a king, an ancient kingdom, who assume Jewish ways. Danny Schwartz has written an incredibly interesting article on whether they're just Jewish or whether that constitutes becoming becoming Jewish. How do you think about the conversion of women? I mean, with the conversion of men, you have circumcision. With the conversion of women, it's it's a different issue. So what I'm trying to suggest is that um, there's no one single answer. There's like, um, you should think of a broadband frequency of different responses to this type of question. But there was something specifically about ethnicities you asked? Just if you could talk about it a, a little bit more, what the concept meant. Oh, okay. Um, well, we have that um, that passage in Genesis 10 I mentioned, where uh, what's specified is is kinship group, land, location, language, and uh, Herodotus when he talks about uh, Greekness uh, mentions um, common religious um, practices and holy places. So language, land, notionally. Um, kinship group, be, having a blood relation, which is what this kinship diplomacy exploited as it developed. Uh, by You end up being related by blood if you have a common divine ancestor from, from back in the day. Um, did people in different ethnic groups marry each other? Sure. Um, but in terms of the, um, the way ethnographers talk about ethnic groups, there's something that modern scholars have termed um, ethnic essentialism, which means that certain ethnic groups act the way they act because of their very nature. The word in, in Greek is phusis. They're, they're that, you know, why do the Egyptians act like that? Because that's what Egyptians act like. And there are different scientific explanations for this. It has to do with constellations are over the particular territory of the of uh, where the people live, it has to do with environmentalism in the sense of what kind of government they have that affects a people's fusis. So it's uh, a kind of scientific anthropology uh, about naming other groups. And of course, one of the main functions of being clearly articulate about other groups is that it what you're doing inversely is talking about your own group. Persians are, are effeminate. We Greeks are masculine, or if you're Roman, Greeks are effeminate. We Romans are masculine. So it, it, you're always, in a sense, talking about the good things in your own group if you're saying bad things about the other group. If you want to criticize your own group, then you say, look, even the Germans do this. So why aren't we doing this? So there's, again, ethnicity is a very elastic and usable um, form of rhetoric and uh, idea in antiquity, just probably like it is now as well. 
going to ask two last questions. Um, one of them concerns whether Jews at any point after the year 70 asked the Romans to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So. If the Jews petitioned to have the temple rebuilt? Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't know of any such tradition, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means I don't, I don't know it. I know that um, Hadrian, um, there's a debate whether um, it was be because he was going to build a pagan city or he built a pagan city as a result of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Um, but once it's a pagan city has a certain type of architecture with temples in a certain place and so on. And um, once Hadrian built his city, he changes the name of the city to, to Aelia, Aelia Capitolina. And uh, we know from a fourth century uh, Christian writer that a local Roman governor thought that uh, when somebody said he, a Christian said he was from Jerusalem, the, uh, the governor didn't know what city he was talking about because it had been Aelia for so long. We're going to have two more questions because one other question keeps coming up. Since so much of this series is about Jewish-Christian interrelationships, uh, how did the Jews view the Christian persecution in the third century? Um, I don't know because we don't, most of the martyr stories we have were re-edited after Constantine. So we don't, it's, it's a, a very um, radioactively hot question now in Christian scholarship on martyrdom, how to view the stories. What happens is that the martyr stories themselves become a kind of writing against the Jews. And the Jews are pictured in these martyr stories as, as complaining along with the pagan crowds that the Christians aren't sacrificing to our, God, our gods, which doesn't make sense. I mean, they, whoever was sticking that in should have done a better, careful job of editing. Um, there are stories in some of the martyrs uh, acts uh, about Jews inviting Christians into the into the synagogue if there's a persecution. We don't actually know that much about um, persecutions because the idea of martyrdom and the idea of Christians, at the true church is the persecuted church, is something that Constantine had to do a lot of spin control uh, with because he was himself, the Roman state was was continuing to persecute Christians. It was just that they were the wrong by the Orthodox lights, the wrong kinds of Christians. So that's partly one of the reasons why you get this great blossoming of martyr stories after the empire becomes Christian itself. The actual third century history is very murky. And finally, a number of people have asked me to ask you this and we'll post it on the website. Can you offer some bibliography, perhaps books that you have written, which could talk about these issues in a little, little bit more detail? Um, advertisements for myself, let me think. Um, um, I wrote a book called Augustine and the Jews, which um, reviews this uh, period uh, before talking a lot about Augustine, it reviews the, the period up to Augustine's um, a fourth, uh, fifth century Christian figure who has very interesting things to say about Jews. So that's, that's available in paperback from Yale. And um, for people who have access to a library, the Cambridge, Ancient, the Cambridge um, History of Judaism, volume four, has an article, uh, actually the whole volume is terrific. Um, there's an article by myself and Odedir Shai, which is precisely on Jewish Christian relations um, in the first um, five centuries. And that will give a lot of bibliography for the, for the energetic to pursue the question. Thank you very much. Just to quote some of the chats. This has been called fabulous, very interesting and thought provoking and erudite and gorgeous. I can only agree and thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation.
which really is a wonderful way of ending this set of lectures. So today, the show is yours. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you very much, Paula, for this really wonderful and fabulous uh, lecture. Uh, well, the show is not really mine. However, I wanted to thank uh, all of you who came to this lecture. So thank you very much again. It was a really great pleasure to host you. Thank you, Mark, for a wonderful moderation. And see you and hear you in another occasion. Have a good afternoon in the United States and good night here in Israel and Europe. Thank you.